Well, tonight we will be in Daniel 3. Uh, for those of you that have been here the last couple of weeks, we have started in Daniel 1 and 2. Um, and a brief recap, and it will be brief, as you guys know, uh, as Daniel starts out. Um, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar's father had uh, took over the throne of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He died when Nebuchadnezzar was about 29. Nebuchadnezzar assumes the throne. There's a lot of wars with Syria, Egypt. Also, primarily, with, that we're studying is with Judah and Israel. Um, he besieges Jerusalem, takes the temple, Take, carries off Daniel um, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to uh, Babylon to train them up and to basically turn them into Babylonians so they can help do the same for uh, the other Jews that they have and in captivity as well as the ones back still in Judah. Um, so Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego um, are in bondage. They finished the finishing school, for lack of a better term. They uh, are now in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Um, they have assumed prominent roles. Uh, because of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that no one, he would not only let them not interpret it, he made them tell him what the dream was and then interpret it. And Daniel, through God, was able to do that. And so that gained him favor with Nebuchadnezzar, at least for a short period of time. And now Nebuchadnezzar is on his throne. And while uh, in the first two chapters, especially after Daniel tells the dream, um, Nebuchadnezzar seems to be a little more sympathetic towards uh, the Hebrews and their God, our God, uh, <clears throat> it was short-lived. And so I will get into the first few chapters, or f first few verses of chapter 3, and we'll start from there. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, which is nine, 90 feet, and its breadth six cubits, which is nine feet. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of, one pro of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, and the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the other provinces gathered for the dedication of that image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, furnace, or burning fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, uh, for those of you that... Uh, sometime want to follow up because this will be the last one that I teach for a while. Um, I've been leaning heavily on uh, Christ-centered exposition, Exalting Jesus and Daniel by Daniel Aiken. It's a commentary and study guide, so if you guys ever want to uh, follow along or read it for yourself, by all means let me know and I'll show it to you. Um, but <clears throat> part of what this lesson they refer to is courage under fire. Um, most of the time in modern day society, what do we think of when we hear courage under fire? Military, yeah, either military or police officers. They even made a movie called Courage Under Fire about a female uh, Medal of Honor winner. And so that's what we kind of think of, but this is a different kind of courage under fire. This uh, fiery furnace that he set up, I mean, can anyone think, and it's just a rhetorical question, can anyone think of a more painful way to die than to be burned alive? I mean, it, it may be quick, but quick's a relative term when you're in that kind of agony. Um, it's, uh, I, I can't think of anything worse. I mean, crucifixion maybe, but they're neck and neck. I'd hate to live on the difference. So it is a terrible way to die. And so uh, a few things to think about before we get into the lesson is that God's people will be confronted with the idols of this world. The second thing is God's people will be criticized by the people of this world. The third, God's people will be challenged to worship the gods of this world. 
Number four, God's people must be courageous in the face of danger in this time, in this world. And God's people can be confident the Lord is with them no matter what happens in this world. So uh, <clears throat> those five main ideas, and we talked about courage under fire. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, as we discussed last week, uh, had some behavioral health problems. Some people think that he was possibly bipolar, but uh, his tolerance with the Hebrew God was very short-lived. He comes out and he builds this image. Imagine, I think, something probably much shorter, but like the Statue of Liberty. It's 90 feet tall, so it's considerably taller than this roof, and it's nine feet wide. And uh, when the music sounds, which probably several times a day, you are commanded by Edict of the King to fall on your face and worship the image, um, which, as we know, according to the first commandment, that is a direct violation of what God tells us. And so he commands it, and for those that have been to the Middle East know what I'm talking about. There are several times a day, I think it's seven, where this music goes off. It's not, you know, like top 40 music. It's kind of these called to, to prayer chants, and it's put over loudspeakers all around the city. And you hear it, and they still do this. They still fall down, and most of them bow towards Mecca, and most of the time that's west from where I was, but they bow down. And they do it. And so I, I don't know if that's where that started from in this, but I can tell you it's been going on for a long, long time. So this is the command, yet <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't do it. Why? Because they're Hebrews and they're not going to have another God in, in, uh, before their God. So on the image, nobody really is sure because all it says in the scripture is the image. It doesn't tell you if it's a statue of Nebuchadnezzar or if it's one of his gods. But it's definitely a graven image and it's up there. And when the music sounds, pretty much start bowing and praying or you're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> last week when we covered it, after Daniel interpreted the dream, uh, and they were in Nebuchadnezzar's good graces, Daniel, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were put into prominent positions in the government of not only Nebuchadnezzar, but, but specifically in Babylon. They were put as, uh, I won't say rulers, but they were definitely like magistrates and all that. And we don't have, they didn't have a uh, government like we have where he's like, okay, well, I have my church and then over here, you know, I got the city government or the county and then I have the state and they don't have all that. They, they got Nebuchadnezzar and he's got some underlings, but that's pretty much it and it, it's a theocracy. It, it's not a democracy where you get to vote. It's one king and it's his gods and you're going to do it his way. Uh, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're not going to do it his way. And that caused a whole lot of problems. So uh, you have some of, I would say they're probably rivals, but they're also other members of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's court that start whispering in his ear. And it always starts out with, oh, king, live forever, which you know at that time uh, it's, they're trying to flatter him. And I'll read this part real quick to you. It says, therefore, starting in verse 8, therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward, and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You king have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind of music fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they start the whisper. The whisper campaign is, you know, hey, king, your trusted servants over here, these guys that you have in a position of authority, they don't listen to you. They don't care what you say. They don't recognize your true authority as king. So they, they automatically start pushing him into that direction of, hey, first of all, they're Jews, so they're not really people according to to uh, the Neo-Babylonian attitude. Um, you, you have them there. They're not as good as we are. They're second-class citizens. But you put them in a position, and you've been good to them, and now they won't do what you tell them to do. They're just ungrateful. So th this campaign starts, and 
it's to essentially unseat them from where they are. Uh, let's see where I'm at in my notes here. So it, when Nebuchadnezzar puts the uh, statue up, it's intended to be a symbol. It's a symbol of national, political, and spiritual unification. It's all in one, all united under Nebuchadnezzar and, and his kingdom and his umbrella. And, and as we discussed, the accusers were likely jealous. Uh, they were rivals. They wanted Nebuchadnezzar's favor, and one of the ways they got that is divide and conquer. They were trying to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego down to their level and not raise themselves up in his eyes. But uh, they were looking for favor, but uh, the three Hebrews had God's favor, and that's the thing to remember. Um, So to, fin to continue on in the scripture, uh, <clears throat> says, then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trig and harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, who is, and here's where I think it really gets Nebuchadnezzar in trouble. The next line, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And if you remember, the you know, Bible has a whole lot of parallels in it. Uh, basically, Nebuchadnezzar throws down the gauntlet. I know you think your God is great, but he ain't me. And you don't know who I am. I have all this power. I am, I am in control of it all. I control the whole region. I'm the richest man in the region. I'm the most powerful. Then you think your God's going to protect you from me? Well, he found out the hard way. So, <clears throat> I really do think that that's the part where God was like, excuse me, that <laughs> he started to really pay attention. So, uh, so as, as we saw, uh, Nebuchadnezzar gives, I'm going to call them the three Hebrews because it gets long saying their names each time. But he gives the three Hebrews a second chance, and he asks, who is your God that can rescue from my power? And uh, are there any other parallels that you guys can think of that we take away from this in today's world? Bueller, Bueller. There's a few, one, one of which is uh, when you look at government, now, I mean, the United States government, any government, do we have the courage, if we lived in, say, the Far East, to stand up for our moral and religious beliefs? I mean, it's one thing to sit here in a nice air conditioning building in uh, Vine Grove, Kentucky, and say it. It's another thing to be somewhere else where the fiery furnace is now starting to stoke up and you are now, like they are, at, at the binary decision. You either hear the music and you worship the, the, the image, or I'm gonna throw you into the fiery furnace. It, it's that simple for them, and pretty terrifying overall. That they, well, if they didn't have the faith in God that they had. <clears throat> so as we continue on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O God, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so there it is. They, they finally have totally defied the king. The guy that, you know, I, I think the problem with exceptionally wealthy people, like billionaires or something, so forth, Nobody ever tells them no. Uh, really? No? Well, let me change your mind. They never get told no, or at least very seldom are they ever told no. Nebuchadnezzar has a lot more power than they do. And so they are not used to being told no. But the three Hebrews told him no in a minute. At, their, at the peril of their own lives, they defied the most powerful man, if not the world, at least in the region. And when they give him the answer, um, says, we don't need to give you the answer to the question. Does anybody, does that like strike a chord with anybody else in the Bible? I'll give you a hint, it was Jesus. Does that remember? Anybody? 
You remember when Jesus is brought before Pilate and Pilate says, you know, don't you understand I have the power to kill you right now and to put you to crucifixion? And what does Jesus say? You know, <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah, you kind of have. And he's like, well, they say you're the king of the Jews. Are you? And what does he say? You said it, not me. And so with that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, they're like, we don't have to answer your question. It's already answered. We're not going to worship your God. So you do whatever it is you think you need to do, but we've made our decision and it's final. So they, they literally rest on the word of God at that point, even when it seems like everything else is, is gone. They, they have no other hope and, and that may fail you. Yeah, Brother Mike. Mm-hmm. They had a standard, and they kept that standard and their God in their heart. But God knows people's hearts. And he tells people, you know, it's in the Bible that where he talks about your standards and your criteria and what's in your heart. He's, that's mentioned more than once in the Bible. Mm-hmm. These guys had that in their hearts that they knew it didn't matter to them because they knew it. Right. They would leave the world by burning, but they knew that they had another world that they was going to was going to be better. But I think it's the standards that they were setting that really infuriated all of these people in the beginnings because as you studied last week in two about everything where they actually were going out and doing the things that they were doing in town with these guys were talking about God. They wasn't talking about Absolutely. Their perspective was we don't, while we serve Nebuchadnezzar as an, he's our employer and our king, our true king is the one we truly study and so they're, or truly serve and worship. And so their perspective is totally different uh, than what he was used to. The, the whole world, or at least in that region, wanted to get Nebuchadnezzar's favor. And while they enjoyed it, they were more interested in God's favor. And so when, they, when Nebuchadnezzar basically puts their back to the wall, for lack of a better term, and says, bow down and worship or go in the fiery furnace, it's pretty much for most people would think this is the end of the line. This is the end of the wor- world as I know it, or at least my world until I pass through. Um, and it reminds me of in Exodus where Moses leads the children of Israel out. And so they, they lead, leave Egypt and they get to the Red Sea. Here's the Red Sea, so unless we can all learn to swim really, really well, really, really far, and Pharaoh's army. It's, it's certain death regardless of what they choose. But they stood fast on, on God's word, and God parted the Red Sea for them. I don't think it's much less of a miracle of what he did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's the same type of thing. It's the same faith, and it's the same God that comes down and, and intervenes. And it's the next verse it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And, and I like the way that scripture reads because it says he was filled with fury. And, and for those of us that you have temper, once it flies into you and you really get fired up, it's like, oh boy, now, now I'm hot in more ways than one with the furnace, and these people are going to pay for defying me. I've been good to them. I've given them prominent positions and all that. All I ask is that they, they worship like I tell them to, and they won't do it. So it says his face was changed against them. So that happy, hey, good to see you. No, no, we're, we're now at odds with one another. And, and so he was definitely, his whole attitude towards them was different. It says, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. 
So he didn't just burn them, or he wasn't intending to just burn them. It was all their belongings, their clothes, everything. Like, here you go. They're going to be burned. They're going to be forgotten about. And I think the example that he is trying to show, for those of you that defy me, this is what's going to happen to you. And so if he can show that, how many dissenters or other people do you think is going to stand up and go, I'm not going to bow down and worship? I don't think there's going to be any, because once that happens, uh, the precedent is clear that he will do it, and you will die. Um, <clears throat> but the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery furnace. So they're actually thrown in. Uh, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared... <clears throat> To his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So what do you all think about that? Let's think about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. They, when they went into that fiery furnace, they didn't feel no heat, they didn't feel no pain, they didn't feel nothing. They wasn't even singed or scorched. Their clothes wasn't, and I don't want to get ahead of you. No, you're fine. Go ahead. God was with them, guys. It's good from the time that Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. says, we're all going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Who's God's at? God's, uh, let's see who's the most powerful. Yes. Yeah, if they weren't, there's something wrong with them. But go ahead. They were probably going to die. Yeah, no two ways about it. Yeah, the, when I was at a Bible study many years ago, when I was stationed at Fort Bragg, they, we had them during the day for lunchtime. Um, and one of the chaplains there had brought up the word submission, which is what uh, Nebuchadnezzar wants, but is what also God demands. And submission is a hard word. It's hard for any person on the planet. It's definitely hard for, for knuckle dragon type males because it means I have to submit. I have to give up my will to serve someone else's. And it's much easier when it's God's, but it's also, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy at all. And we have to submit, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar wants, but that's also what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They submitted to God's will and to God's word, you know, the first commandment. So it's not like they had to search really hard to find it. It's right there in the first one. Don't have any other gods before me, and they, they submitted to that the entire way and, and wouldn't waver. And that's when, when God intervenes. And <clears throat> when Nebuchadnezzar says in, in the version, I think I was reading the New King James, it said, then the king jumps up in alarm because there are four men in the furnace and one is like the son of God. Um, there's a phrase out there that I learned studying this. It's called Christophany or Christophany. Um, and it is the pre-incarnation of Christ. It's, it's the image of Christ that appears before he's actually in the history of man, before he's born. But there's born incarnate as far as in the flesh for us. But th there's examples of that out there. Uh, when, when we read uh, Genesis chapter 1, um, and they said, let us create man in our image. So Jesus was there then. 
He's also there now. Um, <clears throat> he's there in time before he's actually born in the flesh in the fiery furnace. Uh, also, there's another example is in John where he says, before Abraham was, I am. So there's multiple times throughout the, where Christ appears because he's timeless. Man and mankind are, are dominated and uh, subject to time. Christ isn't. God in, in the Trinity is not subject to time at all. He created it. He created it for us, not for him. He's not bound by it. Uh, and so when we look at those images does the symbolism, any specific symbolism come to you guys' mind uh, when, of Christ in the fiery furnace, the fourth man? I'll share one of them with you that I came up with. Um, I think one of the symbolism, one of the big symbols of this is, is that uh, in our darkest hour, regardless of the circumstances, regard, I mean, they're in the fiery furnace. It doesn't really get much worse. But yet, he's still with them and with us, even at that lowest moment. When we think the end is near, when it's certain death, he is still there. And he's still with us and walking around with us, even until the very end. That, that was the first part of the, the symbolism that I came across and I thought of. But the other one, and I think this is just as important, maybe more so, is that uh, it shows that Christ has the power, as they say, over death, hell, and the grave. Well, the fiery furnace, hell is supposed to be a whole lot like that, and yet he has authority over it. He, he walks down there, quite frankly, like he owns a place because he does, and so he walks in there and saves he also has the power to save. So he saves the three Hebrews, but he also has authority over the fire and over death. And so to me, there's a, an entire symbolism and parallel there with, with the new Christ and New Testament that I don't think should be missed. Um, and we'll finish up reading here in just a second. I got a few minutes. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the fiery, burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselor gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies, rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree... Any nation, people, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid in ruins, and there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. The king then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the prophets of Babylon. So now all of a sudden, the king's had a change of heart. Now it's not only were you right, but because you were right, um, if anybody speaks badly about it, I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to burn your house down. And secondly, uh, I'm going to promote Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to a higher position of authority and probably pay too because they were right. And so uh, I find it odd, that change of heart, that all of a sudden he's a believer, at least for a little while. Yeah, I think he believes it is the God, Brother Ron.
He didn't recognize him as the God. Mike. Look at it, it's about what Ron was talking about there. Let's just think about it in this terms. Of in today's world, God tells us, He tells us in Scripture to pray for our leaders. Mm -hmm. No matter how bad they may be, or the situation that they put us in as the citizens of the world, we're still to pray for. We're still to abide by the government, pay our taxes. Mm -hmm. Back in them days, that's exactly what these three men, these three guys, was doing. Yep. They was obeying what their their laws was telling them to do, except for the one thing that they wasn't about to do, and that was to bow down to another idol or anything that was outside of God. But today's world, people are bowing down to the ways of the world. Not giving in to the things that God wants us to do. So, if we think about the situation then, compare it with what we see today, if we, if we as Christians pay our taxes, abide by the laws, and we go by what the government tells us we need to do, but our government, we know, is about as crooked as men leaves on the flower. They might need you to be Daniel for them, so. I know it. Story of my life. The Army says the 10% rule, you got to be 10% smarter in the equipment you operate, and I'm not there, so. <laughs> but no, I agree. They, they, you know, we, we should pray for them, and, and that was leads into one of the questions that I had to end this thing with, was that uh, it says, the Hebrew men faced enormous pressure to conform. How does our own culture pressure believers to reject God and conform to the status quo? Which very much what you just said. I mean, it's it, people nowadays want to. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, there you go. That's it. You can't do that while I'm up here, man. I don't know if you can hear me or not half the time. All right, the next questions everybody can answer but Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need his input, but it says, what are some of the idols of our day that vie for our worship? Power. power. Money. money. <laughs> That's where I was thinking, too. Possessions, power, money, possessions, anything else? Sports. Sports. Social, media. Social media is a big one. TV. TV. Cell phones all yeah, uh, that's all the above, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, speak truth to power is what I've referred, heard it referred to. And uh, we, we've seen it even as, you know, as the 20th, 21st century with, with folks like Stalin. You know, Stalin would have these purges where anybody he considered to be a threat, they're gone. So if you dare speak up, Brother Ryan.
Absolutely. Um, it's funny you say that because it seems like every, when you guys are jumping in, and I'm, I love it, I'm not telling you not to, because the next questions I have, you just answer it before I get there. <laughs> Both of you did, because one of them with Cindy was, uh, it said, uh, what are some of the idols of today's worship, and how are we tempted to react when accusers and critics come against you? How does this line up with the reactions of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So people that don't like to hear no, they actually told them no. And then the next question was, what does it mean to view your life as expendable for the sake of God's kingdom? What did these three men care about more than their lives? As Ron went over that, they, they care about serving Christ more. I mean, uh, I can't remember where it's at in Scripture. It says, I'll serve him even though he slay me. So they are going to serve him even if it kills them. And I think... Uh, God takes notice of that. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that he does because when you have that level of dedication, if you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. Um, and then it says, uh, when God doesn't deliver us from dangers, trials, disease, or even death, does that mean he has abandoned us? Why or why not? Even into the end of the age. So he's, he's always there. It's, it's easy to think we're forsaken because... We're going through troubles or, or trials or, or some even illness and death, but, but he's still there, and he's going to be there after, after this life is gone. And if we're lucky and we do things the right way, we'll get to meet him. Um, it says, how does the presence of Christ affect the way you face temptations to worship and chase after other gods? Some of you guys mentioned like social media, TV, sports. Um, I, I notice for me there's, there are times like I don't uh, – I don't have it on my phone or anything, but in the evenings I'll go home before I go to bed, open up the tablet and just start scrolling through. And I notice I spent a whole lot of time doing it. It doesn't seem like it's a whole lot of time. It might be 45 minutes or an hour. But when you kind of look back and think, did I read or pray for 45 minutes or an hour today? And when you kind of start looking at, hmm, well, I sat here and I watched football all evening. For like I got home from church, turned on the, the game. I watched the 1 o'clock game, the 4 o'clock game, and the 8 o'clock game. And I didn't read or pray during that whole period of time. And I think you need to then reevaluate. It's no, there's nothing wrong with having a good time or enjoying your hobbies, but in moderation and, and keep the first things first, which is God. And then the final thought that I'll leave you with before we close, and I came across it, says, uh, when God did not deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire, or he did not meet them, it's the same God that did not deliver them but he met them in the fire and delivered them out of the fire. And so I thought that was important, that, that uh, uh, he didn't deliver us from it, but he met us in it and then brought us out of it. And I think that's the big takeaway from the lesson. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add before we close? Brother Ron. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Burgess. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Sign my copy for me, brother. <laughs> thank you, no, thank you. Come on up. The reason I want to share this with you is I knew nothing about it until I was listening to the radio station while we were camping. And that is Amendment Number 2 that is going to be on the ballot this fall for Kentuckians to vote on. Amendment two, and I'm gonna read the text of it to you, is pro-life. This Citizen Magazine gives the history of Kentucky's stand on abortion. From the beginning, it was pro-life. 1973, when they had Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Court set that up, Kentucky had to change their laws to abide by the federal law. They, at that time, put in that if Roe versus Wade was ever overturned, they would go back to the Kentucky laws that prohibit abortion. There is a liberal judge in Louisville who has just made a ruling that the Kentucky Constitution allows abortion. And they are trying to push abortion back into Kentucky. 
And here is the amendment that they are attaching that if it's passed, it will settle the abortion issue because it will be in the Kentucky Constitution and then a judge can't overrule it and flip-flop it back and forth like they're doing. The text, to protect human life, nothing in this Alrighty, Brother Ron covered that, so um, sounds like Amendment 2, you want to vote yes if you are in favor of outlaw and abortion in Kentucky, correct? You would vote yes? What? You'd vote yes on Amendment 2? Yeah. Okay, so, and if, if not, you'd vote yeah, no. The Lord you. Exactly. So. Alright, does anybody else have anything they'd like to share before we close out? Yeah. Because he knows if you partake of it, you'll be like him. You'll be like God's, and your eyes will be opened, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, I didn't notice that, but now that you mentioned it, it is pretty good. And that's a good example. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share before we close up? Peanut gallery up there. Another. All right. Brother Mike, if you would, please. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The fiery furnace will kill you in this lifetime, but it'll be fairly quick. Hell won't be. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Well, we're a few minutes after seven, or at least right at seven for me. Does anybody have anything else? I won't hold you up anymore. With that, Brother Mike, if you would, please close us in prayer. <clears throat> Well, we'll see y'all on Sunday, hopefully, so thank you.